Get ready to rumble. Shilling Show Unleashed on the Seven Thunders Media Network. Former city councilor, husband, father, and community watchdog. Your host, Rob Schilling. Welcome to the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Remember, your direct support makes our show possible, and you can directly support this podcast by visiting shillingshow.com and then clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page to make a monthly contribution. We appreciate your support. Shilling Show Unleashed podcast welcomes James Simpson, investigative journalist, businessman, and former economist and budget examiner for the White House Office of Management and Budget, author of the book The Red-Green Axis 2.0, An Existential Threat to America and the World. And this has proven to be true, and we're going to talk about it today. Jim Simpson, welcome to the Schilling Show Unleashed podcast. Hey, Rob. Great to be with you. So let's start off by talking about the Red-Green Axis and describing the components there, starting with the Red. Who are the Red? Well, of course, the Red are the communists, the socialists, the hard left, the international communist movement, basically, which is manifested in this country today, probably best right now by the radicals screaming on college campuses. Really, it's reminiscent of Robespierre and the French Revolution, where they're calling for people's heads. I mean, it's off the charts lunatic, but that is the left. It's part of the overall strategy to confuse, terrify, and rage, create chaos. Would it be fair to say, Jim, that the modern-day Democrat Party in America is a part of this red coalition? Absolutely. Yeah, the Democrats actually decided to go with the communists decades ago. It wasn't as apparent back then. But if, you know, those of us who lived through the Reagan years know that Reagan was attacked almost as viciously as Trump was, Mm -hmm. and even W. Bush was attacked somewhat. But, you know, the real conservatives, the people who speak the truth, get savaged by the left, and that's nothing new. But the Democrats decided a long time ago, you know, in fact, in the 60s, uh, Whitaker Chambers, you know, the former communist who became a Christian and turned state's evidence against the State Department communist cell, Soviet spy cell that he was working with, uh, headed by Alger Hiss, uh, the most notorious traitor in history. He would talk with his friends and say, I'm not sure if we're not on. I think we're on the losing side because the communists are so well organized. They're so barbaric. We just don't behave the way they do. They believe the ends justify the means and they'll use any means they can get away with using. The Democrats decided over time, and and it was sort of a a natural evolution, too, as the left-wing college students became more prevalent, as more radical left instructors took over, as the whole left narrative became more entrenched in our popular culture. You know, it was natural to see politicians come out that reflected that. But by the same token, there were others who were just part of that side. And they said, well, we want to be on the winning side. We, we kind of like our all the perks and bennies we get from being in Congress, or being in the state house or whatever. So we're going to work with America's enemies because we don't want to wind up facing a firing squad when they take over. We want to be on their side. And I really think they made that kind of decision decades ago and and really have been working very underhandedly against the best interests of our country for for decades. So now let's go to the green side of the equation, because a lot of people are not familiar uh, or as familiar with the the color green and why it's being used here. Green is popular color. You see it on almost all of the flags of the various Islamic countries. Yeah, there's a reason for that, the reason that they chose that color to be prominent. Uh, So the green represents the radical Islamic movement. Most 
popularly represented by the Muslim Brotherhood. And of course, the Muslim Brotherhood is Hamas, the uh, terrorist group in Gaza. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is Al Qaeda. The Muslim Brotherhood is the sort of umbrella organization for all the most radical Islamic groups. And the funny thing about it is, well, there's two things. One, it's not strictly a religious based movement. Hassan al-Banna, who created Muslim Brotherhood, was a socialist. And uh, Syed Kitab, who was basically the intellectual father of the Muslim Brotherhood, he was executed by the Egyptians for his uh, subversive activities in the 50s. They all are socialists. During the World War II, the radical Islamists were supported by Hitler. But after World War II, the Soviet Union stepped in and gave them money, gave them arms, gave them training, gave them guidance, gave them pretty much everything. And so really, green is just another aspect of the red. A lot of people who talk about the Islamic threat tend to disagree with me because, you know, you have the Shia who want to see the 12th Imam take over and the Sunnis who want to see the Caliphate return. And, you know, that's the public face of their inspiration. But the fact of the matter is they're strictly controlled by the communists and they have been since the end of World War II because they couldn't they couldn't do a thing without without the guidance, support training and resources of the Soviet Union and communist China. It's basically a false flag operation, but it's a way that the communist movement can get away with terrorizing the world with plausible deniability. You know, Ayman al-Zawahiri, who was the number two of al-Qaeda, was actually a KGB asset that was exposed by Alexander Litvinenko, who was poisoned with polonium-210 in Britain for, for exposing that fact and other facts that he brought out in his book, Allegations, former KGB guy. We should talk about the axis between the two and particularly the coexistence of the green with the reds, LGBTQ and so forth. So we see the Palestinian yeah. <laughs> flag and the rainbow flag, as we did here at University of Virginia over the weekend, flying next to each other. Uh, how are we to put yeah. that together? That really speaks directly to my assertion. The Islamists, the people who strictly adhere to teachings of Mohammed, would behead <laughs> The LGBTQ folks, they would absolutely just rip them to pieces, but they don't. They're both standing there together, shouting and screaming. And you have uh, leaders of care like Nihad Awad saying, you know, we're, we're on their side and everything. And that's confusing to devout Muslims because really, you know, devout Muslims are really devout people. And they don't believe in any of that stuff. They would treat those kinds of groups a lot more harshly than anybody else does. That puts the lie to the entire agenda. The Greens, the Muslim radicals, uh, are right there with the Reds. And as I say, it's just another dimension of the entire agenda. People get wrapped up in the ideologies, and, and that's a mistake, because really what we're looking at is strategy. The strategy is to create fear and hatred and division. That's the strategy. And create confusion, because precisely this, you're asking me this question, what the heck are these Islamists doing standing side by side with the LGBTQ folks when our understanding of Islam as it that they would be seeking their heads. It's an agenda. It's an agenda and it's a communist agenda. It's manufactured crises 
And Lenin, the first leader of the Soviet Union, talked about how they had to ramp up the contradictions and uh, create crises when there weren't any and exploit those crises that did exist. And over and over and over until our society, the capitalist American society, collapsed. That's what they're doing now, and it's on steroids. It's all part and parcel of the same thing. The open borders, flooding the borders, just millions of illegal aliens who create all kinds of stresses on the system, the whole transgender movement. All of this is just, it's all part and parcel of the same strategy. And, you know, the, the other way you can see that that's a fact is by looking at Eastern European countries and Russia China, they, they don't have any of these LGBTQ things. They don't, they don't champion the transgender movement. There is no such thing in those countries. They don't keep their borders wide open. They keep them shut tighter than a drum. Why is it only happening in the West? Because the West is the target. And the reason that they're getting away with it in the West is because they have their own fifth column operating against the best interests of the West, and that fifth column is the United States is called the Democrat Party. Where does gun confiscation and all of this anti-Second Amendment activism come into play? That's always been part of the agenda. The, the lie is exposed right before our eyes when you have the hard left demanding the deinstitutionalization, emptying of prisons, these left-wing prosecutors who put violent felons, gun felons, out into the street without bail to murder again. Meanwhile, the political left agitates constantly for gun control based on the gun violence that those people, they have let out onto the streets to continue their violence. They use that as their excuse to demand gun control, but they're creating the chaos. They're creating the system whereby criminals get away with murder, literally, and the rest of us are locked in our houses. They create that situation. They have exacerbated the problems in inner cities. They have encouraged the crime simply by not enforcing the law. It's basically a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you get a lot of crime, especially gun crime. And so then they're looking for uh, an excuse to take our guns away. That's not going to get rid of any of the guns that are on the street. That will just take away the guns of the legitimate gun owners. Those are the people they want powerless. They want us, the American people, to be powerless against whatever they intend for us in the future. And they've been really pretty open about the fact that they want wholesale guns confiscation. They've been, they've been uh, open about that since well before the Brady bill, since well before, uh, you know, the Brady law came about or even the, that organization, gun control. They've been looking for it since the 60s. The goal is to disarm America so that they can do what they want with impunity. The Shilling Show Unleashed podcast continues with Jim Simpson and the Red Green Axis in just a moment. Online at shillingshow.com. Shillingshowmedia.com is your one-stop shop for websites, audio and video production, and photography. Shillingshowmedia.com will take your project from conception to completion. Shillingshowmedia.com is reasonably priced and highly professional. Need a website for your business? Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. Need a video created or edited? Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. Have a photography or graphic design project? Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. Shillingshowmedia.com is your one-stop shop for websites, audio and video production, and photography. Visit shillingshowmedia.com. That's shillingshowmedia.com. Shilling 
show. Shilling show unleashed. We continue now. Our guest is Jim Simpson. The book is The Red Green Axis 2.0, an existential threat to America and the world. And we're seeing this play out before our very eyes. Uh, one important component here, and this word really has riled the left, Jim, is cultural Marxism. Let's get into that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I should mention, too, you know, I wrote a book in 2021 called Who Was Karl Marx? And the subtitle was The Men, the Motives, and the Menace Behind Today's Rampaging American Left. That became an Amazon bestseller. Uh, I went on with Glenn Beck to talk about that yeah. a number of times. It went to almost the top of the list at Amazon. Mm. It's the best book I've done yet. And if uh, your listeners really want to know what's happening today, how we got here, they should pick up that book. It's an easy read. It's 120 pages. Get it in Amazon. Yeah, cultural Marxism is, you know, the funny thing is about, and this once again uh, exposes the lie of the entire Marxist ideology. People get so wrapped up in the ideology, they don't realize that Marxism is really a strategy for control. It's a strategy to seize power. And it's the most effective strategy ever devised to seize power without firing a shot. So cultural Marxism, Marx thought that he could inspire the working class to lead a revolution to overthrow capitalism. Well, the fact of the matter was that the capitalism was serving the working class quite well. And as you and I know, uh, capitalism or free market economics really is the best and most beneficial type of uh, economic arrangement for the most people. It doesn't serve everybody equally, but it provides opportunities for everybody anybody to do as well as they can part major parts of the world out of poverty the working class really weren't interested in being cannon fodder for the marxist revolution because they're really about seizing power and taking all our wealth the marxists had to think of another way of coming at us and very interestingly back in the 20s guy named Willie Munzenberg, who was a very prominent communist in uh, Lenin's inner circle, very influential. He had hundreds of newspapers, he had stages where they would put on plays and things. He was a real propagandist, very famous. He's the guy who came up with the popular front idea, the guy who recruited a lot of famous Hollywood people to promote the Soviet line. They realized they weren't going to get the working class to help. So he said, we must organize the intellectuals and use them to make Western civilization stink because only then when we have corrupted all its values and made life impossible can we impose communism. And then they sought, set about doing that. They created an organization in Frankfurt, Germany called the Institute for Social Research was a Marxist school. It was filled with members of the Communist International, filled with spies. And when Hitler came to power, the School for Social Research, which became known as the Frankfurt School, because it was in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, relocated ultimately to Columbia Teachers College in New York. And they created, at that time, they published something called Critical Theory. And the idea was to criticize everything about the West. And the goal was to corrupt its values to the point where Western civilization would stink. And that means corrupting its values in terms of you know, sexual mores, in terms of public corruption, every type of corruption they could think of. And that's what critical theory was. And then, of course, downstream from that, the radicals of the day came up with all kinds of innovations, one of which is the very famous one now, critical race theory. But there's critical legal theory, which has become the primary tool taught in law schools today. They don't teach constitutional law very much anymore. They teach critical legal theory, which is another one downstream of critical theory. 
And it's all about dissecting and criticizing every aspect of American society so that we lose faith in American society, so that we lose confidence in the foundations of our country, our constant, the notion of a constitutional republic. The whole idea is to destroy our idea of what America is, how great it is. Instead, it's something that we should be ashamed of. That's cultural Marxism. That became known as cultural Marxism. So this is on display now. They've been working on this for many, many decades, of you, as you have described, Jim. And yep. now we see this yep. at our colleges, uh, which is just uh, the tip of the iceberg, perhaps, of what else is going on in society. What do you envision we will be seeing following these college uprisings? I believe that the country's starting to wake up, so always kind of too little, too late. I think if the election were held today, and if it were a free and fair election, we'd have President Trump again, we'd have majorities in both houses of Congress, we'd have a clean sweep of the states. Trouble is, we don't have free and fair elections. We have corrupt elections. The 2020 election was stolen. Some people disagree with me, but uh, it, it's, it was, absolutely was in many, many, many different ways. One of the biggest ways was uh, Mark Zuckerberg's contribution of $350 million, actually it was more like $400 million, to hire partisan election workers in specific counties where they needed to shore up the Democrat vote. And basically, Mark Zuckerberg bought the 2020 election. There were tons of other shenanigans going on. It's, it's too numerous to list. But in 2024, things are so bad for the Democrats that I think, you know, even with their intended vote fraud, it's very possible that that Trump could win. I'm not sure about the uh, Congress, but, but it looks like Trump could win. And my, th my belief is that they're going to have some kind of black swan event before the election that will either throw it into total chaos, uh, allowing them to cheat or provide them with a pretext to suspend the Constitution and postpone the election indefinitely. I think they're going to pull something. And, you know, we have something like 30,000 communist Chinese military age males coming into our country and going God knows where and doing God knows what, but I suspect that they're basically leading edge of a ground army to assure a communist victory in a civil war if, one, if that comes to pass, or to create chaos before the election. But these riots on campus uh, could be the pretext. These riots, if they don't get contained and they keep growing, like the George Floyd riots did over the summer of 2020, that could be the black swan event, you know, just becoming more and more violent, more and more widespread. You know, most of the agitators in those um, riots are, they're paid. You know, it's, it, this is, these aren't spontaneous protests. They're well-funded riots. And you can tell because of the, fancy signs they all carry and everything, but we know that to be true. It could well be that device they use to make it more and more violent, to create more and more chaos, to literally make the election very difficult to administer, keep a lot of people away from the polls, or maybe just give them pretext to suspend the election altogether. Jim Simpson, if people would like to get copies of your books on Marxism or the Red Green Axis or any of your other work, how can we find you online? Well, just go to Amazon.com or uh, you can go to my website, crisisnow.net. Crisisnow.net has links to my archive of articles, and it also has a link to my Amazon page where all those books are um, featured. You predicted it years ago, and it's coming to pass before our very eyes. James Simpson, thank you for joining us today on the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Thanks so much, Rob. Great to be with you. That concludes another edition of the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. 
Visit us online at shillingshow.com where you can directly support this podcast by clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page and making a monthly donation. Your support is essential for the continuation of the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Until next time.